Hey y'all, Coach Bach here from Jump Science. Uh, we're gonna do a analysis of the straight leg hip thrust exercise. All right, it's demonstrated here by Carlin Isles. Shout out to Carlin. All right, so what we're gonna do is analyze this exercise and just use that to uh, cover some uh, training topics. All right. So on the whiteboard here, we have uh, you know two surfaces here, and the body is laid across them with contact at the heel and then the upper back. All right, so uh, obviously gravity is pulling the body down, okay? Uh, in order to resist that, you're gonna have to uh, apply force at these two points of contact at the heel and the upper back, all right? Pretty simple. So you're pushing force down uh, into those two surfaces, and then those surfaces are pushing force backwards up uh, uh, on you to, to hold you up, okay? So I think the best way to understand this is to um, think of that upwards force from those surfaces as being your uh, resistance force, okay? So if we come down here, we look at the hip joint, all right, and we think about those two forces, which uh, on average are going to total your body weight, right? Um, they don't necessarily have to be exactly half, but um, together they're gonna equal your body weight um, if you're staying still, okay? If you're moving up and down, that is gonna change the forces, but um, if you're staying still, they're gonna add up to your body weight, okay? And they are applied at the two ends of levers here, okay? So these forces would be pushing you towards hip flexion, okay? Basically folding your body in half at the hip, all right? Now, so these forces, on average, one half body weight, that's not super high force, okay? But, what we have here is long lever length, okay? So to, to get lever length, what you do is you look at the direction of your uh, resistance, which is vertical in this case, and you take the perpendicular direction to the joint you wanna look at, okay? So in this case, it would be a horizontal direction from the point of contact on the heel uh, all the way over to the hip joint. So basically you have like the length of your leg is your lever length, okay? And then on the other side, it's basically you know, the length of your torso. It's from your hip all the way up to where you're contacting on the upper back, okay? So these are very long levers. Uh, so the forces here are not super high, but they have a lot of leverage pushing you towards hip flexion, okay? And that means uh, it actually is gonna be a pretty challenging hip extension exercise um, for your glutes and your hamstrings, right? So your, your glutes are here and your hamstrings are here. Those are your big hip extension muscles and they're gonna to have to generate hip extension torque to oppose these hip flexion forces, okay? And because uh, these are long levers, it's actually gonna be a, a decently challenging hip extension exercise even though you're just using body weight. Then also if we look at the knee joint, again, uh, we have the same forces. Now we have uh, a shorter lever here and, but then a very long one here and those forces are basically pushing your knee towards hyperextension, right? So your hamstring muscles are gonna uh, have to use a lot of effort to resist that and keep that knee in uh, slight flexion, okay? So you get a lot of uh, glutes and hamstring effort out of this exercise, even though it's just body weight. And uh, I know a lot of people right now are training without a gym, and uh, this exercise is a good option to try to train hip extension strength without needing a lot of additional load, okay? Uh, hip extension strength is a tough thing to train without a lot of load because hip extension is a very strong movement, all right? This exercise is an example of a way to do it. So the first topic I'm trying to point out is just lever length, all right? Now, I'm not making any uh, claim about long levers and short levers, like one is better than the other, I'm just saying you should be aware of lever length. You should pay attention to it. It should be something you consider uh, when you're designing a training plan or um, determining the technique you wanna use for an exercise. Let's do a quick example with another hip extension exercise, the hip hinge. So when you hinge with the bar in your hands, it's typically taught to keep the bar close to your legs. All right, and what this does is it keeps the resistance lever shorter, okay? So our resistance is uh, gravity pulling down on the bar, right? So it's vertical. So if you look at the horizontal, the perpendicular distance to the hips, by keeping the bar close to the legs, you're keeping that horizontal distance shorter as opposed to letting the bar come out here, okay? So you're keeping the lever shorter. And that's why the hip hinge is a very strong exercise, right? Like people can do this 
with a lot of weight, all right? Uh, if we move the location of the bar, put it up on the shoulders, now we're doing a good morning. Um, and now that lever can't stay short, right? As I go down, that horizontal distance is getting much longer than when I have the bar in my hands and I keep it by my legs, okay? So because that distance is getting much longer, the lever's longer, the bar has more leverage against my hip extension, and that's why a good morning is a much lighter exercise than a hinge with the bar in your hands. It's the same movement, it's the same implement, uh, but a different location of the load makes a huge difference. That's the influence of lever length. Next topic is muscle length. All right, so if you think about the glutes here, uh, they are not lengthened. They're in a fairly shortened position, okay? The glutes lengthen uh, when the hip flexes, okay? So since you're uh, in extension here, the glutes are not lengthened. And that is another reason why this exercise is pretty challenging without a high load, because uh, in shortened positions, muscles can't produce as much tension, all right? Uh, if you're not familiar with the length tension curve of muscle, it's uh, basically a bell curve uh, for your, your active tension, which is like the, the uh, tension you get from protein contracting, right? Um, then there's a passive tension, which comes out, out here. That's where things start to stretch out, okay? But over here, when you're shortened, the point is you don't have as much tension as if you lengthen the muscle out. So shorter muscle length uh, is a reason why the straight leg hip thrust is difficult. Um, but it's also kind of counterintuitively, that's a reason why it's not as hard on the glute and hamstring muscles. Because they're not being stretched out, uh, they're not going to generate as much tension and therefore the demand on them uh, structurally is not as high. So this is not an exercise that uh, you would expect to get uh, sore from, okay? At least not compared to some other exercises that uh, stretch the muscles out more, okay? Um, and then lastly, with the shortened muscle length, that makes this more of a specific exercise, meaning you're gonna get um, strength specifically in this exercise. You may not get uh, a lot of transfer to other strength exercises uh, that use a wider range of motion. Okay, so research has shown that if you train at shortened muscle lengths, it does not transfer to longer muscle lengths as well as training at longer muscle lengths transfers to shorter muscle lengths. Next topic is downward momentum. All right, so notice how uh, Carlin is kind of dropping down quickly and then having to stop himself. By giving his body that momentum, uh, he's going to create more force when he stops it. All right, so harnessing downward momentum is a way to uh, get higher forces, both uh, if you're talking about impact with the ground or uh, higher muscular forces as well. All right, another thing you should be considering in your training. Next topic. Uh, is the straight leg hip thrust disruptive strength training. All right, this is a concept I brought up in my uh, speed training series. Um, and I said that your uh, most powerful, most influential general strength exercises can be uh, disruptive to athleticism, okay? Because they are very, uh, a very different stimulus from like sprinting and jumping. So is the straight leg hip thrust disruptive strength training? Uh, no, because we are staying in a pretty extended position uh, that's a similar position to, uh, you know, sprinting and some jumps and uh, a lot of athletic movements, okay? So there are not going to be um, much of any, like, negative adaptations to the straight leg hip thrust that would uh, mess with your athleticism, all right? Now, it's still not specific training, right? Because, uh, I mean, you're, you're laying on your back. Uh, it's still a strength training exercise. It's not necessarily really explosive. Um, the time frames are different. Okay, there's still a lot of differences. This is not really specific training, um, but it is definitely less disruptive than say like a deep squat. So with that in mind, a reasonable thing to do would be to use uh, the straight leg hip thrust during track season as a way to uh, try to maintain hip extension strength without being uh, disruptive to your speed. Next topic, muscle synergy. Okay, so uh, classically in anatomy, people uh, have taught uh, antagonist muscle groups, right? Like the quadriceps and hamstrings are antagonists because the quads extend to the knee and the hamstrings flex the knee, all right? But uh, we have these things called biarticulate muscles. They cross two joints. They act at two joints, 
Uh, the hamstrings are an example actually because they cross the hip as well. So they're a hip extensor and a knee flexor. Biarticulate muscles create synergy between muscle groups that are uh, typically thought of as being antagonistic. All right. Now I have a whole video on this topic alone. I'm going to put it in my story so you can go check that out. Uh, but basically the synergy occurs if we are flexing together the, the joints or extending together. Okay, so during most athletic movements when we're pushing off the ground or doing, during your, uh, you know, your functional ground-based lifts like squats, lunges, deadlifts, you are extending joints together. And in that situation, you get synergy between muscle groups. Okay, same is true if you're flexing the joints together. But in the straight leg hip thrust, we are doing hip extension uh, combined with knee flexion and then uh, maybe like a little bit of extension action at the ankle as well. Okay, so we're mixing flexion and extension. So what's happening here is you're actually cutting the quads out of the synergistic chain. All right, so that means that neurologically the coordination of this movement is different than anything uh, athletic or anything, any like more functional exercise, okay? Now, this is where we get to opinion. That's where I would say, you know, you're probably not gonna get as much um, translation to other exercises from this as you would say a squat or a lunge, okay? Uh, because neurologically, the movement pattern is a lot different. That doesn't mean it's a bad exercise or it's worthless or anything like that. Um, but it is not functional because you are uh, mixing flexion and extension together. All right, so the coordination is very different. And our last topic is the force vector theory. This should be a fun one. All right, so there's a theory that uh, we have basically vertical and horizontal athletic movements. All right, and then we have um, exercises which have vertical or basically you know, along the long axis of your body resistance. Okay, such as, you know, your basic vertical uh, free weight movements, squats, lunges, deadlifts, things like, things like that. Um, and then you have horizontal or what they call anteroposterior, basically like a front to back type of resistance. Um, and the straight leg hip thrust would fit into that category, right? Where you have gravity kind of pulling your butt down and so you're doing extension this way. Okay, so that would be called uh, horizontal resistance. And so people have theorized that horizontal resistance exercises or anteroposterior resistance exercises translate better to horizontal athletic movements such as acceleration and cutting. Now here's the problem. In order to achieve horizontal athletic movements, what we do is position ourselves on an angle and push, okay? Or positions ourselves on an angle like this and push. We achieve horizontal movement by angling our push to have a horizontal component, all right? We don't do it by hip thrusting our way around the field or the court, okay? So there really isn't any athletic movement that's driven by, uh, you know, front to back force like this, okay? Um, now, people have had the idea that top speed sprinting is that, because of the, you know, the cyclical action of the leg that happens. Um, but truth is, top speed sprinting is determined by your ability to uh, overcome gravity really quickly. It's all about vertical force, how fast can you pop off the ground, okay? Um, that's what determines how fast you can move over the ground. Even though this action is occurring, it is not our ability to direct force backwards behind us that determines how fast you can sprint, okay? Uh, gravity is still your main enemy in top speed sprinting, and it's your ability to overcome gravity and pop off the ground that determines how fast you can move over the ground, okay? Uh, so there really isn't any athletic movement that is driven by front to back force, okay? It's really all driven by uh, longitudinal force. We just position that force on an angle to go horizontally. So your so-called anteroposterior exercises uh, things that have this front to back resistance, uh, such as the straight leg hip thrust or any hip thrust, uh, these exercises are not more relevant to uh, horizontal athletic movements. Okay? Honestly, that's a nonsensical assertion.